like sharing with everybody is the struggles I face because everybody thinks that when you're playing at that level that you know you're you're so confident and you're so focused. I was focused, and it's strange because growing up here in Guelph, I played at Laurier during university. I was an All Canadian. I was a you know I was recruited for the national team as one of the top players in Canada. And then when I made it to the national team, something happened, and all of a sudden I lost all of my confidence. I remember being on the on the field training with all the other players and thinking. What the hell's wrong with me? Why am I so scared and nervous about, you know, making a mistake? And the interesting thing is when I made it on the national team, I actually made it on the team and I became a starter the very first game I made it to. And from that point on, I was a starter every year, but something inside of me just felt this anxiety and I always was worried about making a mistake. And I remember playing in the World University Games and we were playing against China and it was a big game, it was semifinals. And the night before that game, I was sleeping in the room with my roommate and I, I was having anxiety attacks the whole night. And I remember I would turn on the light so I'd read and like try to calm myself down, turn off the light, and all of a sudden I would have this crazy anxiety attack. And I went and played the next day, had an okay game, but hadn't slept a wink. And this went on for years. So come 1995, it was a World Cup year, so anybody that knows soccer, we all trained to play in the World Cup. And this is the first time Canada had qualified for a World Cup, the women's team. So here I am, I'm at training camp in Hamilton, I'm training with the team, it's the first tryouts before the World Cup, and I get the coach come up to me at the end of the week and she tells me I've been cut. And it's funny because I remember that, I actually remember the shock of it, because I had been a starter up until that point, but then I also remember I felt like it was almost a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I felt like, well, yeah, I wasn't good enough, so I probably shouldn't have been here anyway, so she's probably making the right decision. Even though I was devastated, part of me was like, well, maybe, you know, I wasn't good enough anyway. And so she ended up telling me to keep training with the team. I came back to Guelph. The team was living in Hamilton. So I came back, back and forth between Hamilton and Guelph and trained with the team in case somebody got injured. Lo and behold, before the team left for the first World Cup camp, uh, which was in France, we were doing a tour all over the world before a World Cup, I made it back on the team because a player got injured. Now, I only made it on the team for an interim basis. So I made it to France, and my sister, who is here right now, knew kind of what I struggled with, and she had given me a book to read. And the book was called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. And the premise of the book is basically that your thoughts create your reality. And I remember sitting on a bus in France and reading this book and sitting there thinking, are you kidding me? You mean all of these thoughts in my head are mine? and they're not controlled by any external circumstance. It's not my coaches telling me I'm not good enough. It's not my dad telling me. It's me telling me I'm not good enough. And I, I literally couldn't believe that this is the first time I actually realized my thoughts were controllable by me. And I read that entire book on this bus, and I remember after reading it, I sat there and I thought, there is no freaking way that my mind is going to control me. I made a decision literally right there that I was gonna start controlling my mind. So I went on to play in that tournament and was one of the top players in the tournament for Canada. And I remember the coach, Canadian coach came up to me afterwards and she said to me, wow, like the best thing I ever did was cut you. And I was like, well, <laughs> maybe the best thing that happened was reading that book. So it, and, and the difference in what and how my experience was on the national team was so extreme. I literally went from losing sleep, having panic attacks, anxiety to realizing this was all in my head, I could control it to sleeping at night, going on the field, and I'm like knowing I was going to do well. I was so confident. I was not going to let my mind control me. I remember being in Japan and sleeping like a baby all night long and getting on that field and the coach coming up to me after Japan and saying like, you're the player to watch now. You have become that player. So I went on to play in the World Cup just weeks after getting cut. And I ended up being one of the top players in Canada and the world. And I scored Canada's first ever World Cup goal in that tournament. So I hold that record. That will never be broken. I ended up playing another five years with the national team. Uh, I ended up getting inducted to the Canadian Soccer Hall of Fame. So my career lasted longer. I ended up, uh, I got injured. That's how my career ended. But I got into broadcasting and television. I'm keeping this really condensed because I know it's only 10 minutes. Um, I was going to stop at, and then I went to the World Cup. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it, done. So 
how, five, six, seven years later after f- finishing my career, everybody always talks about how when you're an athlete and you finish your career, you go through this depression. And I always thought that I had bypassed that because I got into broadcasting. I was commentating. I was still around the team. I felt like I'm good. Like I actually, my, my career transitioned so well that I didn't have that. Well, come 2006, a bunch of things started kind of crumbling around me, which was my career as a, a broadcaster, my business at the time and a few other things, and uh, I got into this really bad hole. And I think that was the first time I really felt the effects of ending a a sporting career that I played for about 20-something years of my life. And I got into this place where it was just a very dark spot. And the best way I can explain it, which is a great way to see what my head was like, is I painted my entire house this dark, dark brown. I literally wanted no light. I didn't, I didn't want any light. My sister would come over and she'd open up my curtains and be like, get some light in here. And I'd get mad at her. I'd be like, no, I, like, I want it dark in here. And that's kind of what I was going through. I went this, through this really dark spot where I just didn't know who I was anymore. And I remember her coming over and me just saying, like, I don't know who I am anymore. Like, I don't know who I am. And so I remember one day sitting there and going, I can keep going down this hole and probably it won't be good because it wasn't a a very happy place to be, or I can make a decision to do something different. And I remember reading this book, and in this book it had you um, look at all areas of your life. It was like a a wheel, and it asked you what were you, you know, between one and ten, where you sat with finances, with social, with um, where you, your family, and everything was zero to two. I was just that unhappy in so many aspects of my life. And the very next page it said, do one thing that'll make you happy. Figure out one thing that'll make you happy. And I remember sitting there going, wow, I don't even know what makes me happy. But I knew it came back to sport. And I knew I had to reintroduce sport into my life. It had been six or seven years since I'd played any sort of sport. I knew I couldn't play soccer because I ended my career with a bad knee injury. So I decided to play volleyball. And I found a volleyball league here. I ended up starting to play in a competitive volleyball league. And that one decision changed my entire life. Everyone that now is in my life, a lot of them, are my volleyball friends. Making one decision to do something that makes you happy and to find that happy place is what transitioned everything in my life. And when I look at my whole career and I look at my history, that's all I really did. I played soccer because I just, it made me happy. I loved playing. Even though my mom would say, when are you gonna learn to cook and clean and be a good housewife? I played, cause, and, and I literally played thinking, I know I'm supposed to be here because this is what makes me happy. So I call my, my talk destination happy because I think we lose track of everything in life and we have all these goals of where we want to be, what we want to do, how much money we want to make, and I think it all starts with just happy. What makes you happy? What makes you happy? <laughs> And I swear, everything starts with happy. Every, I mean, I think John Lennon was asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he said, I want to be happy. And it's so simple. I think if we all I th- slowed down a little bit and just figured out what made us happy, I think our lives would be so much better. And, and beyond that, now when I go through little glitches, I've actually started something called Expand Your Experiences. And for me, that's trying something new to expand your experience and make you happy. Whether that's a walk in the park, whether that's going for a glass of wine with your friends, or whether that's you know singing in the bathtub, whatever that is for you. I just think that it's all about figuring out what makes you happy, and it's amazing how many people don't know what makes them happy. And I always say expand your experiences, get out there, find things that make you happy and just do them. You'd be surprised how that impacts the rest of your life. So my two, my two takeaways from all this is, and if we could do this all on a regular basis, which I wish I could too, figure out how to control this and follow this, and I think life would be way better.